We're very proud of Boeing in Montana, um, lots of different reasons. Um, uh, not too many years ago, when the summit over in Helena was looking to get on Boeing's bid list, uh, Tom Hoffman, who had the outfit, called me up and said, Max, gee, how do we get in Boeing's bid list? They don't pay attention to us over here in Helena. And so I said, well, I'll call up. I happened to know the CEO at the time, named Phil Condit, and asked Phil, just send somebody over. I'm just ask you to send somebody over, because we got a great operation. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, great. At least you come over and look at it. Sure, Max, we'll do that. Came over, got off the plane. His engineers, what are we doing in Helena, Montana? As soon as they saw Summit, hey, this is pretty cool. This is neat. We like this. And um, next thing you know, contracts are being made, not just Boeing, but other companies. And so good, as you know, that uh, Boeing is saying, hey, maybe we should buy this outfit. They're doing such a good job at, at HAP. So we're just very proud um, of, of Boeing's relationship with Montana. And all the engineers, MSU, tech, that go over to Boeing, that's a great connection as well. Um, and um, Steve and I are here, along with uh, Mr. McNerney, just to kind of make a little announcement here to kind of help get things going even farther. It's great in public service if the legacy that you can leave is much longer than the time that you serve. And I think that Senator Bacchus is making that connection with Boeing is something that will be valuable to our state for what I'm hopeful is truly generations to come. We have a wonderful and unique relationship in as much as Boeing, after it had the introduction, recognizes that Montana's a great place to do business. We have a talented, trained workforce. But more than that also, too, with Helena College, our two-year college right there in Helena, near where Boeing's office is, it's been a great relationship and a pipeline for Montanans that want quality jobs and want to stay in Montana to um, have the opportunity to work with a Boeing company. So pleased to have the CEO pleased um, with the relationship and the difference that it's truly made for the state of Montana. Certainly appreciate your and your company's efforts. Thank you, thank you, Governor. <laughs> um, here we are, everybody. Jim McNerney. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, before you leave, before you leave, Senator Baucus, Governor Bullock, uh, we do take great pride in our three operations here in Montana, the biggest of which is our fab plant in Helena, which we acquired, as Max alluded to, in 2010 to supply titanium and other hard metal structures to our commercial airplane business. Boeing Helena builds parts for our 737, 747, 767, and our innovative and fuel-efficient new 787 Dreamliner, including the 787-9, which many of you aerospace buffs know, will make its maiden flight in about an hour. So it's very exciting for us at Boeing right now. And Helena is on that airplane in a big way. This morning, I'm pleased to announce, along with the two gentlemen who, whose uh, management of the government and the regulatory environment here made it all possible, we're about to announce that we're expanding, or we are announcing right now, we're expanding our production capacity and employment in Helena to accommodate growing global demand for Boeing airplanes, including, as I just mentioned, the newest version of the Dreamliner in the air and the one that's coming soon thereafter that, the 787-10, which we just launched with record launch orders uh, earlier this summer. Boeing Helena will play a key part in fulfilling that huge demand for both the current Dreamliner and the two new ones, and will be involved in both the design and manufacture of the newest, the 787-10 side of body cords, this is a critically important part of the structure of any airplane. It's the part <laughs> that joins the body to the wing. That can't fail, okay? <laughs> we won't. This $35 million expansion will increase the square footage of our Helena facility by nearly 50% and add 20 to 25 full-time employees to our team there, which is currently 144 strong. Boeing Helena, yeah. Boeing Helena is already a key link in our company's hard metal supply chain. Now it will provide more opportunities for the community and the state 
as we grow our footprint there. And as everybody knows, these types of investments have even larger overall economic impact as construction activity takes place, new employees obtain needed goods and services but from businesses within the surrounding community. Senators, Senator Baucus and Governor Bullock, as graduates of Helena High School, I'm told, I've met a couple other Helena High School graduates in the back room. Go here. Bengals. That, go Bengals. Uh, <laughs> the, the, two, <laughs> the two of you, uh, along with everyone at Boeing who so much appreciates your support, can take special pride in the fact that our workforce in Helena has impressed us over and over and again in three years since we've acquired the facility. Our investment in the site's infrastructure people and the new products is testament to, Helen, to the Helena team's ability to deliver on their commitments and establish themselves as a reliable, globally competitive supplier to our commercial airplanes program. With that in mind, let me pause for a moment to offer a big hello and congratulations to Eric Smith and the Boeing Helena team who are watching as we speak by webcast. Eric, here's to you and the team. It's very rare that I make a speech longer than a politician. <laughs> Two politicians make a speech, but I'm almost done here on this announcement. I also want to make it clear that Helena and Montana earned this opportunity and is what attracted, as Max, Max's story really illustrated. I remember when Phil Condit first went to see Max and learned of why we should be here more and has led to all of this. And Max and the governor have created the right environment for business, especially businesses that compete as we do on a global scale against tough global competitors. More on that in a few minutes when I make a speech, but, I, but just think of the opportunity in the meantime that Montana, Boeing, and our other U.S. partners have in a commercial airplane market that will require 35,000 new airplanes worth $4.8 trillion over the next 20 years, and we're all going to be in it together. With these kinds of numbers, though, it's easy to see why it's a pretty competitive world. So, Senators, Senator Baucus and Governor Bullock, the investment uh, that we're making here today and announcing today is all about the future. It's all about Montana, Boeing, and it's about Helena. I want to thank each of you again in all seriousness now for your leadership and commitment to the people of this state, to the nation, and to the competitiveness of business of all sizes and all levels. Without you, this moment would not have been possible, and because of you, I believe there could be many more like it for Boeing and others doing business here in the year, here in Montana in the years ahead. So thanks again for all your support. Thanks. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Governor, thanks for being here. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you. You're making the effort. Right? Yeah, right. And then I'll come back to this. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much. Um, Look, here's Jim McDury, just like Safra, Katz, and John Hudson. They fly all the way here to, to be with us, and it's a really honor. We're very, very grateful. Very thank you. Thank you, Jim, very much You're for very the time and attention you've spent to us. It means an awful lot to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, it is great to be here, and because I came all that way, I'm now going to give you a speech, okay? Uh, and it will touch on some of the same themes that are, that are symbolized by our investment here. Uh, today, more than 200 Boeing employees and 700 retirees call this state home, as do many, as, as do more, I should say, than 130 businesses that supply or otherwise support our programs and facilities. Boeing and its suppliers generate almost $6 million of economic benefit annually to the state. And as you can tell, we value doing business here. Our relationship with Montana goes all the way back to World War II, when B-17 pilots trained at an, airfield, at an airfield near Glasgow, which, as all of you know in the audience, is a former military base that we've been using for environmental testing, including noise reduction, since the 1970s. 
In fact, in fact, Glasgow played a key role in developing the technology that makes the Dreamliner so quiet. And I also want to tell you that I've never been in Senator Baucus's office when he didn't ask me to do something else at Glasgow. <laughs> the Dreamliner has a noise footprint nearly 60% smaller than previous airplanes of its size. And it's one of the key features that has led to its more than 930 orders from 57 customers on six continents. That is by far the largest order book in, in the wide body airplane world ever. And if you are counting, like I am, more than 80 of these Dreamliners are now in service with 14 customers flying an average of 175 lower noise, more fuel efficient flights a day for a total of more than 32,000 flights so far and nearly 7 million passengers carried safely to their destinations. Also in Montana, our deface, Spence, de defense and security business continues to provide logistics and training support to the Minuteman 3 ICBM stationed at, Malstr at Malmstrom Air Force Base. To get a sense of the history, Boeing received the contract to build the first Minuteman missiles in 1958. And we're proud to say the missile was built, tested, and operational in time for the Cuban Missile Crisis just four years later. That's a timeline, by the way, that now would be considered miraculous with today's defense <laughs> procurement process. But don't get me started, OK? Montana also is home to one of Boeing's 10 preferred machining suppliers, Sanju Industrial in Kalispell. I just spent a few minutes with Dick before I came out here. Sanju, which is not an Irish name, I've been told, which devotes significant attention to employing U.S. military veterans, and I know Dick's a vet himself, has built up a great track record of on-time delivery and first-time quality over the six years our 737 program has been working with them. As a result, they've been able to expand their manufacturing capability and provide meaningful job opportunities, not only up in Kalispell, but in other places around the state. The 737, by the way, is the top-selling commercial jet in history. We've delivered more than 7,700 of them, and our growing backlog now exceeds 3,000 400 additional orders. The vast majority of those orders, in fact, about 80% of all the airplanes we build are exports to customers outside of the United States. And here I note how much Boeing deeply appreciated the advocacy of many of our Montana suppliers when reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank stalled last year. Those efforts help break the logjam in Congress. As Montana already knows, XM is an important contributor to U.S. competitiveness, jobs, in the global marketplace. It actually generates revenue for the Treasury, despite what everybody thinks, while supporting both large and small business exports. It doesn't lose money, it makes money. And it is absolutely critical to Boeing in our supply chain. So it's not corporate welfare. It's about supporting the competitiveness of companies like Boeing and its partners in places like Montana. In all, Boeing is drawn to Montana by its skilled workforce and an overall business environment favorable to commerce and investment. And the senator and the governor get a lot of credit for sustaining that. In this respect, the Big Sky State sets a worthy example as America works to move its economic recovery into higher gear in an increasingly competitive world. I know the state of the economy, in particular the rate of growth in full-time employment, continues to be a top of mind issue. Hence the focus of this event and how much I appreciate it. Earlier this summer, a business roundtable survey of U.S. companies reported mixed expectations into the future about sales, hiring, and investing for the next year. Sort of an uncertain feeling of the people who run companies. Overall, the results reflected an economy still on a slow road to recovery, with growth below the level we'd all like to see to ignite more significant hiring. Now, 
Notwithstanding the intense pressures of our domestic defense market, Boeing has been growing because our markets are growing, especially in the Asia Pacific and Middle East regions. We're also growing because over the years we've maintained an intense focus on innovation in our products and services and at the same time continuous productivity improvements to fund those investments in innovation and to ensure the affordability of our offerings to customers. Fundamentally, I believe that the long-term growth and prosperity for any company or any country hinges primarily on innovation and more directly on those things that fuel innovation and ever-increasing competitiveness. That's where I see each side of the public-private equation having very specific responsibilities. Companies must focus relentlessly on productivity to fund investments in future, in future products and services, while governments must maintain growth-oriented policies on a range of issues, from trade to taxes to regulation and education, just to name a few. That's in order to provide a climate in which the engines of economic activity and job creation, large and small businesses, often together, can compete effectively and do what they do best. The unrelenting reality of this new global economy is that jobs are created and sustained primarily through increasing competitiveness and innovation. And over time, jobs will be most plentiful in those regions without Montana, within Montana, within the United States, and around the world where employment and related business conditions support rather than impede those two driving forces. Despite the challenges we face, I am, in fact, incredibly optimistic that as a nation, we can reassert our global economic leadership and ignite significant and sustained growth and job creation here at home, provided our public and private sectors work together on the issues at hand. And I'm convinced that manufacturing will be, and indeed must be, a major part of getting the economy fully on track. At Boeing, we never stop believing in American manufacturing. Today, we employ more than 160,000 people across the United States, most of them in the business of designing things, building things, or directly supporting those who do. In fact, we added U.S. manufacturing jobs by the thousands, even at the depths of the recent recession, to meet the demand for our innovative and affordable new products like the Dreamliner. And we continue to invest heavily in the United States, ranging in scale from the expansion I just announced today in Helena to our new 787 production and delivery facility in South Carolina, which, by the way, is the first new airplane factory built in America in over four decades. Taking this beyond aerospace, other U.S. manufacturing sectors, including those that sell consumer durable goods also are poised or are, are already undergoing recovery and expansion. I'm sure my old friend, who you're going to hear from later, Alan Mulally, will have some, some very valuable things to say on, on that subject. Now, there's a guy who's done a job uh, of global leadership with a company. You'll, you'll love hearing from Alan when he gets here later today. From my perspective, I'd even venture to say we're on the verge of a renaissance in American manufacturing for a variety of reasons. First, one of the silver linings of this recent recession is that American companies were really forced to focus on productivity to remain healthy and meet customer demands for higher value products and services at lower prices. The downside for workers, and I believe it is a temporary downside, is that companies can produce more with fewer resources, which has tended to constrain new hiring at current growth rates. The longer-term upside for American workers is that U.S. companies are about as well positioned as they've been in decades, at least with respect to their internal operations and cost structure, to compete and win on a global scale. Second and related, Wages in, in the major consumer manufacturing centers overseas have been rising to the point where the business case for locating production 
outside the United States is no longer as compelling as it once may have been. This creates a potentially virtuous cycle for American workers because rising standards of living in developing markets, in Asia especially, have the effect of making these countries costlier to build in while at the same time expanding the number of overseas consumers that can afford and will buy American products. There is a third significant factor that will fuel, literally fuel, American manufacturing. And that's the domestic energy revolution made possible by new energy-related technologies. In terms of extraction technologies, I think you'll hear later from Ryan Lance of Conoco, is, and he's the expert here. But as I see it, the dramatic increase in oil and gas discoveries in this part of the country especially could have dramatic economic and geopolitical effects that are not yet fully appreciated. According to one estimate, by 2015, the U.S. will overtake Russia as the largest producer of natural gas. And by 2020, the United States will overtake Saudi Arabia, yes, I said Saudi Arabia, as the world's largest producer of oil. If combined, <laughs> if combined with greater efficiency and conservation, the effect could be sub substantially lower energy costs, making America dramatically more competitive for locating manufacturing and production operations. And it is also important to remember that while manufacturing remains a relatively small share of the U.S. economy, it has a disproportionate impact on job growth because of the engineering services, supply chain, and other support that manufacturers require. All the more reason, I should add, for the United States to pursue a more vigorous free trade agenda so products that can be made affordably in this country will have access to more customers in more markets all over the world. With that thought moving us squarely into the role of policymakers, I know there is no shortage of views and proposals from across the ideological divide on how to get this country in high or at least higher gear. I am struck, however, that within the center-left, center-right spectrum, there is broad agreement on the basics. A more balanced regulatory regime, flatter, simpler tax code, come back to that, properly targeted investments in education, innovation and infrastructure, and a more flexible and strategic immigration policy, especially with respect to highly skilled workers in science and technology. Given that I don't have much more time here, I'd like to highlight just one case in point, tax policy, which Senator Baucus knows probably better than anyone else on the planet. A general consensus is emerging that an overhaul of the U.S. tax system is long overdue. It's been more than a quarter of a century since our last major reform in the tax code took place. Many of you may recall that a number of loopholes were curtailed or eliminated back then, making possible a corporate tax rate reduction all the way down to 34 percent, which did deliver at that time within the global context that existed then a competitive boost to the nation. But since then, Subsequent Congresses and administrations have added back complexity, carve-outs to support various interests, some 15,000 changes in all, according to a couple of conversations I've had with the Senator. Meanwhile, other developed countries have been steadily reducing their rates to garner their own competitive advantage. Today, America's average statutory tax rate of 35 percent, more than 39 percent when you include the average state tax incorporated into it, is the highest, the highest in the industrialized world, a full 10 percentage points above the average of the countries we compete with. We are simply no longer competitive with our corporate tax structure. Last December, I joined the CEOs of other major U.S. corporations in writing a letter to Senator Baucus and his colleagues on the Senate Finance and House Ways and Means Committees with several proposals to overhaul the U.S. tax system. The first was to reduce the corporate income tax rates. Not exactly a shocking recommendation coming from a U.S. corporate leader, but the second part of our recommendation was a little more surprising. 
Boeing and many other companies also expressed a willingness to give up a number of very beneficial tax preferences in exchange for achieving the broader goal of lower rates. We recognize that everything will need to be on the table in these discussions, and everyone will have to give a little to get into the end zone. But we need a tax system that encourages growth and competitiveness for all American companies. To their credit, Senator Baucus and his colleague, Senator Hatch, have taken up this cause. They have called for a clean slate approach that starts with a presumption of no loopholes, deductions or credits of any kind, and puts the burden of justification on those who want them included, all for the purpose of keeping the tax code flat, simple, and broad as politically possible. We all admire your senior senators. We all admire your senior senator's strong-minded efforts to make something happen in the time he has left in office, and there is little time to waste. The ranks of the bridge builders and deal makers in the halls of Congress seem to be thinning with each passing election. At the same time, other nations not encumbered by our Byzantine tax code and regulatory apparatus are upping their game when it comes to other levers of competitiveness, including education, innovation, and further productivity initiatives. So my message for today for all of us in the public and the private sectors is to recognize the urgency of the situation and to come together for a purpose that transcends the next election or the next earnings report. Doing so will help produce the changes needed to spur higher economic growth, create more high-wage jobs, and achieve the goal we have all to of broadly shared and sustained prosperity across this country. Now I'm about to turn the microphone back over, but just one more time I want to express my appreciation for Senator Baucus. Working with him over the years on matters of consequences to the nation has been as meaningful as it has been inspiring. If you're a business person from, Mon from Montana, you're doubly fortunate to live in this wonderful state, first of all, and second of all, to have had Senator Baucus as your senator for 35 plus years. Thanks very much for listening, and I appreciate it very much. <laughs>